Sirs, moms, ladies and gents, welcome back to the Redcoat History Podcast, the show for people who love British military history, like me, I'm a geek. We're currently nearing the end of Season 3, which has been an extensive examination of the Peninsular War, fought in Portugal, Spain and the south of France between 1808 and 1814, arguably the most effective campaign ever fought by the British Army. In the last episode, Mark Thompson and Charles Esdale joined me to discuss the failed British siege of Burgos in 1812 and the subsequent retreat back to the Portuguese border. Well, today we're going off on a bit of a tangent, I suppose you could say, and we're exploring the little-known history of black soldiers serving in British regiments during this period. And yes, to my surprise as well, there were actually quite a few of them. It's a really fascinating story. John Ellis has written extensively about these men and he's joining us today to tell us more. If you enjoy the episode and want to support the show, then please subscribe and write a review as that really helps. If you're feeling particularly generous, you can also consider making a small donation via coffee.com slash redcoathistory. That's ko-fi.com slash redcoathistory. Any money received there will go towards the running of the show and research for future episodes. Anyway, without further ado, let's meet today's guest. I'm John Ellis. I'm a Yorkshireman, a former soldier working in education at the minute. Uh, I've always been interested in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it's, it's truly global, historically significant war. But my interest was never in the weapons or the battles, but, but the men who served, who they were, uh, what were their lives like, what happened to them afterwards. My, my BA thesis used pension records to explore recruitment and promotion in the Napoleonic British Army, uh, looking at issues of class and ethnicity. But whilst researching, I found references to black soldiers. So I just theorised that they should be in the same records. And they were. Uh, and I found them throughout the British Army. So that's the Crown or Royal Regiments. We always knew they were in the Indian Army and in the West India Regiment. But, but yeah. this, was, this was a first for me, that they actually were in British regiments, regiments that still exist or their antecedents of regiments that exist. Um, and so I thought, well, why can't I use the same processes? Uh, and so I, I, I found them and they're in the pension records that you can get them within seconds on Ancestry and Find My Past. They're all from the National Archives. And, uh, and today I've found five, I've identified 500 men. Uh, and sometimes it's a, a single reference to a man being black, but in other cases, it's pages and pages of records. So in the case of, um, of Charles Arundel from St. Kitts, who served in the 43rd foot through the peninsula and France and the War of 1812, an officer's written down every single battle or engagement he was in. Uh, these must be the most recorded um, workers anywhere because that you've got muster rolls and pay lists, which are every two or three months, you can find them there. But there's no there's no indicator there that they're black. But what happens is you can then identify them in pension records and then backfill their service records. Um, and and it, it's if they survive long enough, you can then find them in parish registers and in the census returns, and you can trace their descendants. But but these men of which there must have been thousands, uh, were, were clearly there in plain sight at that time. Wow, it really is fascinating, isn't it? Because I've, I've been doing a, a lot of reading, uh, particularly on the peninsula, but on many of the wars of, the, um, of this era. And you, you, you find the odd one or two reference, you know, I think there's something in Grattan about a couple of black uh, bandsmen in the 88th. And uh, I've got a book here by my side, Wellington's Red Jackets, about the 45th Nottinghams. And there's a reference to a, a you know, what he calls a Creole officer. And uh, but other than that, you wouldn't know there were so such large numbers. Can, can you try and give us a sense of um, how many people of colour you might find in, in, in your average regiment, if that's an easy question to answer or not? Probably not. But what sort of numbers would we would we expect to see in a regiment uh, on average? If you take a if you take a single battalion uh, in the infantry or a regiment of cavalry, 
uh, 500 to 1,000 men, you might find one black soldier. You might find three or four in the band. But some regiments had uh, one black soldier as a trumpeter, drummer or bugler per company or troop. So it, it's quite a significant presence. In addition to uh, black partners, wives, uh, mixed heritage children, um, so it, it's far more diverse, I think, than is than is represented. Well, and I guess the the obvious question then is, where did these men, in general, I know I know we're talking about hundreds of individuals, but in in general, from your research, where were they coming from? Uh, about twenty five percent of them are African Americans, and I think we've got the War of Independence and the War of eighteen twelve, and and that leads to. Uh, them coming over. Other ones are from the French colonies in the Caribbean. And I think when Britain takes those colonies, those men um, come over to Britain. Uh, a lot from Jamaica and Barbados. A, a handful are British born, but they're all resident, nearly all resident at time of enlistment in Britain or Ireland. Uh, so London, Dublin, Portsmouth, Plymouth, and they're drawn from the black population that's already here. A number uh, are recruited from prison of war camps, Portchester, uh, Liverpool, but that's only 20 or so. Uh, some are themselves the sons uh, of soldiers, either white soldiers or black soldiers. So, um, and when, when we use the term black, the British Army at the time makes no distinction between Asian or African origin. They're simply all black or of colour. Uh, and in the records, there are very few derogatory references to them. So um, some of the, the slang words, um, they're not used in their records. They're black, of colour, mulatto, creole. Uh, and, and it's quite respectful uh, of them and, and it's clear that they are soldiers so they they're not servants they enlist in the same manner as their white peers and they serve in the same manner but they're given a musical role and, and that's where the uh, the racialized aspect comes in that they're generally restricted to musical roles well i wanted to follow up on on the musical role in a second but but it's very interesting what you say, because I've also noticed the, the references I've come across in the memoirs and so on of, you know, black bandsmen or black soldiers have been quite respectful. The term person of colour, which we use these days as well, of course, has now become a sort of, you know, a common term, um, you know, for, for non-white people, let's put it that way, was used very regularly in the memoirs and so on. And I find that interesting because you move on to the Victorian era and the terminology would have been much more derogatory. Uh, you know, you, you see uh, in South Africa a lot of references to the K word, which I won't say, or the, the N word, which again, I won't say. Um, so it's really interesting that times were very different. You see that just in people's terminology. It, it almost seems like the Georgian era was, was uh, much more relaxed than the Victorian era around issues of race. Is that something you've picked up on? Uh I, I think so. Uh, certainly, if you look at the newspapers by the mid 19th century, they're, they're, they're very clearly racist. Um, but I mean, I, th I think we've got to understand that this is the period of slavery. Their service is racialized. Um, there, there are incidents of them being verbally abused, physically abused. A uh, uh, black drum in the 29th foot is murdered in, in Aberdeen, which is, is, is a racially motivated killing. Uh, by his peers? No, he's uh, murdered by, I think, men of the Aberdeen militia. Uh, oh, wow. his, his name was John Sampson, who's from Barbados. Um, he was recruiting in Aberdeen in 1807. Uh, and I think they've, they have racially attacked him, uh, but he was a boxer. So he bested them and it took a right. gang of it took a gang of them to murder him. They stabbed him uh, in the street. But but that was uh, there was a trial um, and they were found not proven, which I believe is a Scottish legal judgment. Um, and the 29th, but the 29th foot were criticised for having black drummers, uh, mainly because the, there's an inherent level of equality in black and white serving together, but also because. Um, sanctions, floggings were carried out by musicians. And if the musicians were black, you'd have a black man flogging a white man. Uh, so the 29th foot were criticised in Boston, uh, just prior to the Boston massacre. Uh, and in the Napoleonic Wars, they had white recruits refused to serve in the 29th because they had black soldiers. Wow. That's crazy, isn't it? And, and, and I guess then that's a good time to kind of ask the, the, the bandsman thing. Why, why were were black recruits um, generally 
pushed into the, the you know, be, becoming bandsmen and drummers and buglers and so on? What was the reasons for that? Uh, firstly, there's a, a fashion for Turkish percussion-based music, and, and there, are, <laughs> there weren't that many Turks. I think another thing is the, uh, the, the kind of the racist belief in the natural propensity for music of black people. You've got an increased... Um, size in the black population in Britain, which by the end of the 18th century is about 10,000. And I, 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 I think it fluctuates depending on what's happening elsewhere. Um, most of these men are foreign born. Um, and so they're moving in. And, and I think, I think it all comes together that, that, that seems to fit. Um, it's also, I think that by being bandsmen, they're not necessarily active combatants. But clearly, these men are serving uh, from, I think, the earliest references in 1715 to the Old Pretenders' Rebellion. And uh, the last reference is to the Indian Mutiny. Um, so, so their service has continued that, that, that whole time. So that's well over 100 years. And it's particularly um, prevalent during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, some regiments have them from the early 1700s early 18th century some regiments have them from the early 18th century but the foot guards in the 1780s the three regiments of foot guards all recruit three or four black bandsmen and i think during the napoleonic wars as battalions are created and new regiments are created that sets the, that sets the tone so it's fashionable um and and that's why there are so many of them and would would any of these black soldiers also have served in sort of an infantry capacity or were they literally just working as, as bandsmen? Well, uh, the, the musical role, uh, it's quite clear. Some are bandsmen, but some are deployed at company level as buglers and drummers. Some in the cavalry are at troop levels. So in the 4th Dragoons, they had eight to ten black trumpeters serving at any one time. And when you check the muster rolls, it's one per company. The 29th foot has... 10 serving at any one time and this is from the 1750s till the 1840s so it's one per company so they're very much in harm's way um they're all on enlistment apparently trek the same as the white recruits so they must have military training uh, a black trumpeter clearly once he's sounded the charge he has to charge with the officer and he has to fight um there are references to them working as pioneers uh, and in the 1820s, the commanding officer of the 78th foot said his black soldiers made very good marksmen, but their colour did not suit Highland dress. So what you've got is that they they were good bandsmen, they were good soldiers, good marksmen, but it wasn't appropriate for them to serve in the ranks. But we also know that um, the 43rd foot at Badahoff collapsed its band and sent them to the ranks. There were two black soldiers, at least, at Badahoff in the 43rd. Uh, Charles Arundel from St Kitts and Gibeon Lippitt from Rhode Island. Uh, in the winter of 1813-1814, the band of the 18th Hussars who'd lost their instruments, they were sent to the uh, sent to the ranks as well. So they were expected to fight. Um, yeah. So it's still a dangerous job. Yeah, well, yes, and, and black soldiers fight and black soldiers died. And, and the records suggest that some were wounded. George Rose was wounded in Germany in 1814 and he was shot through the right arm at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, and George Rose was from Jamaica uh, and his records refer to him as a man of copper complexion. Right. Well, I mean, uh, an example here that, um, that I was able to find just during a brief bit of research, which backs up exactly what you're saying, is from the 79th uh, during the siege of Burgos in September 1811. And I won't read the whole thing, but it, it says towards the end, it says, uh, Sergeant Mackenzie was severely wounded in this affair and his small party behaved with the greatest bravery in their endeavours to prevent the escape of the French garrison. And bugler Charles Bogle of the 79th, a man of colour, was afterwards found dead at the gate near a French soldier. The sword of the former and the bayonet of the latter through each other's bodies. So I think that gives us a great idea, doesn't it? That these weren't just, you know, at the back playing music. These guys were right there in the front line. Uh, yes, at Waterloo, John Lewis Friday, an African in the 33rd foot. Uh, he was, uh, I don't believe he was a bandsman at Waterloo. I think he was serving as a private. Uh, in a 
well, in a line company. Uh, there was there was a suggestion that the 33rd might have, have run when charged by French cavalry. So uh, Colonel Elphinstone, um, he he when he award, or awarded the Waterloo Medal, it was only to the men who stood. So anybody who run didn't get it. Uh, John Lewis Friday, who uh, later married a, a woman from Hull, he got the Waterloo Medal. James Goodwin from Barbados, referred to as a man of colour, was a trumpeter at Waterloo. He was the brigade trumpeter for the 6th Cavalry Brigade under Major General uh, Vivian. And Goodwin's records um, have the reference in, he has distinguished himself in action. Um, and... and Vivian led from the front and Goodwin was with him. Um, and there are lots and lots of references to these men serving in combat. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I could I could talk about this all day. I mean, are there any are there any specific uh, people you've researched who you've you found to be uh, some of the more interesting characters you've come across? Could you give us some examples well, I'll refer to Goodwin. Um, James Goodwin was born in Barbados in 1788, was a carpenter. He enlisted in the 18th uh, Hussars in Arundel in Sussex in 1809. He served in the Peninsula Campaign. He was at Vittoria, Ortez and Toulouse. Um, he's brigade trumpeter at Waterloo. He gets the Waterloo Medal. Uh, he transfers to the 4th Dragoons. He's trumpet major in the 4th Dragoons, and, and there are a handful of black NCOs. Uh, he serves in the First Afghan War. And he's married. Uh, at his marriage, one of the witnesses to his marriage is the wife of another black trumpeter. Uh, and then when he's pensioned in the 1840s, he, he settled in, in, in London. And that's where he dies in the, uh, in the 1860s. Uh, but there are what lots a career. Of, that's amazing. Well, he, uh, the, the man, he, he'd done everything. Uh, yeah. uh, he, I think he's... He was in, but there were others like him. William Affleck from St. Kitts was also a trumpeter, but in the 10th Hussars, he served in the peninsula, Sahagan and Benevente. Uh, he's then later on in the peninsula and in France. He's also a trumpeter at Waterloo uh, and he settles in London, raises a family and um, works as a hairdresser till he dies. Uh, so, And it, it is possible if they survive long enough to find them in civilian records, census returns, parish registers. And, and I've traced the families of, of a number of them. Uh, some of the families are black, so, some are white. Um, right. But, but it, it's not possible to distinguish them on records just by name, because, of course, most names are anglicised. Um, mm. and, and that's where, that's where you have to be uh, quite discerning and you need pension records or regimental description books. And another black soldier of interest was George Rose. George Rose was a Jamaican. Uh, his mother was black. His father was, a, a, by George, George Rose's own account, a Highlander from Inverness. Uh, Rose escapes slavery. In 1809, he joins the 73rd Foot. He serves in France. He serves at Water Waterloo. Uh, and then he transfers to the Black Watch, uh, the Royal Highland Regiment. Uh, he does another... 20 years and he ends up as band sergeant uh, he's married he's got four children he leaves the black watch he settles in glasgow he becomes a vicar and, and, it, and it's well documented in newspapers of the time uh and then on the death of his wife he returns to jamaica by that point uh abolition ha has occurred uh and he becomes a vicar there and he, he dies in 1873 but there are hundreds of rose descendants now he has family in scotland family in Liverpool, where three of his children settle, uh, and family in Australia. Uh, but, I mean, George Rose is a black soldier in an, an elite Highland regiment. Um, and, and I think it's to the credit of the regiment, uh, as well as, as an indicator of, of how good a soldier Rose was, that he reaches that rank. Because uh, at that point, he's got command over white soldiers as well. Um, his discharge records, somebody wrote, an, an officer wrote on them, an exemplary soldier uh, and I don't think there can be any higher praise yeah no I think that's amazing and and when you presumably have you have you spoken to any of the descendants of some of these guys I think you mentioned you may have done and how was their reaction was this all news to them was it something that they'd heard about or or have these stories kind of been lost to a degree uh, I think the stories are lost because we're talking about 200 years we're talking about a, a fairly transient population 
uh, but mainly uh, they're very pleased pleased to know. Uh, some of them, interestingly, are aware that going back into the 19th century there were certain physical characteristics which suggested that somebody had been black uh there were also kind of family laws so um it, w w one of the branches of the rose family and there were many uh that they believed that he was a color sergeant at edinburgh castle and i think what they actually uh, had got was he was a colored sergeant and he right. had served at edinburgh castle prior to leaving uh, and so some of these things are passed down but the the families i've traced and i think there's, there's about 10 of them uh some of them are in america there are some in australia uh there, there are some amongst the uh anglo-indian eurasian population uh, still in india uh, right. uh and, and lots in lots in britain because most of these men settled in britain or most of the men i've been able to find afterwards settled in britain yeah. And have we or have have you come across many examples? I, I've, I've found one in my research um, of of officers of colour. Not within the British Army. Uh, I believe that the French did commission black officers. Um, I've seen the reference to the one in the 45th foot. 45th. Yeah. His name I can I've, I've managed to find it. it took me a little while yesterday afternoon. His name was Bishop, Captain Bishop, and it says he was a Creole of respectable birth and education of Barbados, of which island his father-in-law, General McLean, was governor. I don't know if that's uh, of, of interest to you or if that fits with anything you've seen. Uh, it, it's of interest. Um, I think when, when I researched that he didn't actually join uh, any of the battalions because you could purchase commissions and not necessarily go. Um, but but I think very much that there are issues of class as well of race. Uh, yeah. And generally speaking, I, I think the army probably turned a blind eye. Uh, but but it's interesting that our we are more shocked by the apparent presence of these men than people in the past were. Um, and I remember, I think it was about five years ago, there was an episode of Doctor Who set on, uh, with the Victorian British Army mining on Mars. Um, and there was a black actor playing a soldier and there was more consternation caused by the fact that it might not be historically accurate that there was a black soldier in the Victorian army than the fact that the British army w was on Mars mining and fighting <laughs> Martians. And, 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 and that in itself is quite telling. And, and I think often we're doing a disservice uh, to, to these men, also to the men that they served alongside, the white men they served alongside, and to their regiments, because clearly we are more racist than they were, uh, because we, we are unwilling or we are questioning their presence, when actually, I think for Queen Victoria's reign, there were only 30 years where there were no black soldiers. And by black soldiers, I mean people who would be identified as black. I've found um, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of black soldiers serving in the Victorian army. Uh, and, and there's no issue. They're just serving as ordinary soldiers. So clearly, a, a generation, two generations, um, whilst there might be some physical identifiers of them being black, at, of the family being black, they, they do serve. So, so I, I think we need to reassess what we believe it is. I, I, think, I think some of this is down to the Cardwell reforms, the 1880s, which um, the, the army of the Napoleonic Wars was far more diverse. It was far more of a British army. A third of the army are Irish. There's a high proportion of uh, Scots people uh, locally recruited. You've got Spaniards. Uh, mm. You've got Germans moving moving over and not necessarily in only distinct regiments, but that there are Dutch people serving. And, and so the, re the, the regiments at the time are far more diverse uh, by nationality and by ethnicity than, than, than we accept uh, oh, sorry, than we believe they were. Uh, and Because when I joined the army and we did the regimental or core history, all the pictures are of white people. And so I, it, it's something that I could relate to. So Battle of Waterloo, you know, there's somebody in a painting that looks like me. But that's not the reality. That's not what it was. And, and, and I go back to this fact that we, it's almost like it's a Walter Mitty-ish kind of robbing people's medals isn't it 
um, and, and it does them a disservice and, and, and it does their white peers a disservice as well, I think. Um, so, so if only for accuracy, but we need to be doing more, uh, or at least that knowledge in it. And this isn't saying that we should, uh, uh, I don't know, redo Seaborn's Waterloo and make every fourth man black, because that's not what we're talking about. But we could make the trumpeters black in some regiments. Uh, you know, and, and it's it's just to credit their service. And that's all it is. Um, and that's what I think we should be looking at. Uh, if if we want it as accurately portrayed as possible, then then let's look at how it was. Yeah, no, that it, it really is amazing. And 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 when then did did uh did it did it stop happening? Was there a point where you mentioned the Cardwell reforms? Was, was there anything specific in the rules and regulations that stopped the recruitment of black soldiers, or or did it did it actually in fact carry on right the way through? It, it, the enlistment of black soldiers seems to peter out in the eighteen twenties, uh, but very few regiments kick people out for being black. They simply don't replace them. Uh, the last black soldier to serve was John Charles from Trinidad. He was a black drummer. In, was he, he was actually the big drummer in the 32nd Foot. He's discharged in 1845. Uh, the officers and senior NCOs uh, have a whip round. They buy him a gold watch and give him £10, a considerable sum of money. But they do serve after that. Uh, Thomas Frederick, who was a farrier sergeant, um, his father was an African-American, also called Thomas Frederick. His mother was white and Irish. He serves till 1860 um, in the 14th Dragoons and then the 6th Dragoons. But I think what you've got is a combination of um, that perhaps the black population in Britain actually reduces because uh, it's peacetime mainly. So I ended with uh, Thomas Frederick, who uh, was discharged of pension in 1860, and he settles in India with his Anglo-Indian wife and his children. Um, but certainly the presence of uh, black soldiers or mixed heritage soldiers in the second half of the 19th century needs more research. Some, the descendants of them, appear to have served unnoticed. Um, but I'm not sure why. I think there are changes in military music. It's less percussion based. Um, peacetime and abolition generally reduces the size of the foreign born black British population. And so there, there are, I think there are fewer recruits. There are restrictions based on foreign born soldiers as a whole, including French and German soldiers. Um, and, and that's less about race. That's more about fears of espionage. But, by the second half of the 19th century, I believe in King's regulations, uh, it mentions that people should be of European origin. And by that, it means British or Irish. But we do know that the black presence continues um, because the grandchildren, the great grandchildren um, uh, who are mixed heritage, they still serve. But you've also got um, wives, partners and children. And, and, and I don't think that that ever goes away. I mean, Mary Seacole in the Crimean War was the daughter of a black soldier. So the, the presence is there, but it's just, it's hidden. Was she a nurse, was she? Mary oh, Seacole, was she oh, a nurse? Uh, yes. Do you, do you want me to do any? I haven't actually gone for anything on Seacole, but... Um, she, uh, no, she, I mean, no, we don't have to deep dive. I just, I just wasn't sure of the reference. That was all. So I just wanted to kind of work out who she was. Okay, uh, Mary Seacole, who was a prominent nurse in the Crimean War, uh, alongside Florence Nightingale, uh, she claimed to be the daughter of a Scottish army officer uh, and a black woman. Uh, Mary Seacole was from Jamaica, so she's clearly a mixed heritage, uh, a popular figure uh, at the t amongst the soldiers, a popular figure when she returned um, to Britain as well. So I understand, I'm quite interested, that there was actually a unit of freed slaves, people who had ran away from uh, slavery in America and then fought alongside the British during the War of 1812. Is that something you know much about? Uh, African-Americans constitute the single largest group of black soldiers that I've identified, and that's both before and after the War of 1812. So I think there's, there's an exodus of black loyalists um, in both wars, and, and I think what, what the British uh, did was they encouraged the slaves to rebel, uh, to, to introduce this fifth column behind 
prospect behind the US's right. Uh, sorry, to, to encourage a fifth column uh, behind the US lines. So clearly this led to an exodus of, of black loyalists, a number of whom joined the British Army and the Royal Navy. Uh, George Wise from Nova Scotia. His parents were both from Virginia. Um, and, and Wise joins the 29th foot when he's 10 years old. Um, he, he serves through the Peninsula campaign and he settles in Liverpool and raises a family. Edward Baptist, uh, who's a bandsman in the 44th foot, um, he served in the War of 1812 and the 44th foot uh, burnt down the White House. Uh, Gibeon Lippitt, and uh, Charles Arundel from the 43rd also fought in the 18, uh, in the War of 1812. Uh, but also the West India Regiment fought in the War of 1812 as well. So there was a, a considerable black presence uh, in the British ranks during the War of 1812. And I guess for anyone who doesn't know, the West India Regiment was, was except for the officers, all, all black, correct? Uh, officers and senior NCOs uh, were, were white. Um, and and it's, it's this point where we touch on the issue of slavery. Um, I haven't found any references to slavery or it in in the service records of these soldiers. Now, it doesn't mean that the army didn't purchase them. Uh, officers were sufficiently wealthy to purchase black soldiers. Uh, or, sorry, officers were sufficiently wealthy to purchase uh, slaves. I, and enlist them. A number of officers in the army were linked to slavery. Picton, for example, who who uh, who died. Uh, General Picton, General Picton, who died at Waterloo. Um, but I don't think that the regiments of the British Army necessarily had to do that. That they they seem to be recruiting from the resident black population in Britain. Uh, which is a free population. The black soldiers seem to be recruited and enlisted in the same manner as their white peers. Uh, so there's nothing in their records that would suggest that uh, there's any definite link between any regiment and a soldier and the issue of slavery. In fact, it seems to be the reverse, that black men are joining the army to, to escape from that. And if you look at the records of the West Indy Regiment, um, the, and, and Oh, I'll, it's a divergence, but it needs addressing. Um, yeah. It, in the 1790s, the War Office was the single largest purchaser of slaves, uh, and and those slaves were used to, to to man the West India Regiment. So the British Army was up to its uh, up to its elbows in slavery, but the individual regiments uh, don't appear to have needed to recruit slaves so yeah. individual regiments don't need to have purchased slaves because the black population seems willing enough to enlist voluntarily and and this might be di diverging again on a bit of a tangent and we can cut this out if, if if you're not sure but those men who were purchased by the army to serve in the west india regiment did they, were they technically, did they remain slaves, do you know, or were they given their freedom and essentially just enlisted on, on you know, uh, whatever terms of service it was, as opposed to still being slaves? I don't know if that's something you're aware of or not. Uh, I wrote a couple of things on the West Indy Regiment based on uh, pension records and description books, uh, so, I, so I can answer that. Uh, it was quite a contentious issue at the time, particularly for the uh, the plantocracy in the Caribbean, that these men were being enlisted. They were being trained in, in the use of arms um, and on enlistment, they were free. But enlistment with its rigours and its strains and the discipline that's involved was going to be a minimum of 20 odd years. So they were yeah. free, at, almost like um, an indentured uh, kind of servitude uh, and the suicide rate was quite high when you look at the description books. So, so this isn't this, this isn't freedom as such. So from your research, have you come across any anything that would show that black soldiers were treated any differently, were treated uh, harsher by, you know, with, with discipline uh, or, or do they seem to have been treated the same from what you've been able to find out? I think the army acts as a social uh, safety network for the black population resident in Britain and Ireland at the time. Uh, they're limited to racially defined roles. Uh, they're frequently denied promotion. 
Uh, there's racist behavior from white civilians and their white peers, verbal, physical abuse, murder. Uh, some white recruits refuse to serve alongside black soldiers. As military musicians, they're responsible for flogging their miscreant white peers. That makes them incredibly unpopular in some circles. Uh, and in times of martial law, and remember, at this time, there are no standing police forces. It's the army that does it. It's black soldiers that have to flog civilians uh, and particularly in Ireland th th this is problematic uh, when it comes to pay they're paid exactly the right amount for their ranks but uh, service in the east and west indies is not reckonable towards their pension on the grounds that they're natives so if you were born in the Caribbean and served in India you'd you wouldn't get any extra pension credit for that unlike white soldiers when you look at the positives, um, military service had strict terms of reference. Uh, King's regulations guarantees freedoms. You can't just be flogged. Uh, you can't be treated cruelly. Uh, so so in, in, in that way, it, it helps them. Um, as musicians, they're paid more than private soldiers. Uh, so trumpeters, drummers, buglers, uh, who, who, were, who were on roll, get paid more than privates. Bandsmen are paid as privates, but they're also given um, additional pay as a subscription by officers. And in, in a guards regiment or a cavalry regiment, which has got wealthier officers, there's more money. Uh, they could also moonlight. So there are references to black soldiers in the guards also serving as musicians in London uh, in civilian bands. Uh, they get military training and the right to bear arms. And we do know because their records uh, reveal that they do know how to fight. Um, they're not segregated. Uh, they've got equality with white soldiers. They're in the same barrack rooms. They're serving in the same companies and troops. Uh, they're allowed to have their wives and family on strength because it's six wives on strength for every, every hundred men. So we know that there are references to black soldiers being married and, and, and having families. And when you tr track them down in the census returns from the 1840s and 50s, you, you can find them. Um, they're also very often joining existing black communities. So if you, if you look at a regiment like 29th Foot, they have black soldiers for 90 years. The, the Fort Dragoons have black soldiers for 130 years. So they're joining institutions where racial norms have been negotiated. Uh, you can find instances of them joining together, uh, of recruiting each other. If you look at the parish registers for London and in particular in India, uh, you've got black soldiers from the same or different regiments um, being witnesses to each other's marriages, witnesses to the baptism of children. You've got the children of black soldiers um, either joining up themselves uh, and in the 29th foot, uh, there was a John Bacchus from Jamaica and his son was born in the 1770s in Dover. And his son became a, he also became a German in the 29th. And then he becomes band sergeant in the 98th foot. So you've got these familial links, which are uh, prevalent in the armed forces anyway, now, even now, but at the time that they're, they're serving there. Um, there are very few references to them being involved in, in crimes and, and and the media of the 18th and 19th century is very quick to pick on uh, anything that involved black people and put it in the news so most of the men that i've got their services are unnoticed they leave uh, their civilian lives are unnoticed but as soon as one commits a crime it's a black soldier or a former black soldier um uh, there were very few desertions, and that isn't because there's nowhere to go, because the black population of Britain here has got 10,000 people. So if, as soon as they moved through a city port, there were bound to be black people there. But they don't desert very often. Um, if they're discharged, and remember that regiments were reducing all the time, so black soldiers would be discharged in the same as whites, in the same manner as white soldiers, you find that they're re-enlisting as well within days or, or weeks. And they're re-enlisting because military service gives them something. It's a sense of belonging. Uh, and I describe them as journeyman soldiers. So it would not be untypical for a black soldier to be in one regiment with a group of black soldiers, be discharged and then join another regiment that's also got black soldiers in. Um, their character references are invariably positive. Now, partly that's 
because to get a pension, you have to be well behaved. But uh, George Rose was an exemplary soldier. Uh, James Goodwin distinguished himself in action, uh, but routinely they're described as good, trustworthy, sober, and that's very important, uh, soldiers. Uh, there was an African called Thomas Crawford who served in the 4th Dragoons during the Peninsular War, and Colonel Dalbaic of the 4th Dragoons wrote in his records, there cannot be a better behaved man than the within named Thomas Crawford. I have known him for four years, and four years in 1814 meant he must have served with Dalbaic in the Peninsular War where Dalbaic is wounded. Uh, and it says, during which I never remember him either neglect his duty or be guilty of the most trifling misdemeanor. Now, I was a soldier and I would have liked that as a reference for me. But interesting, <laughs> interestingly, though, Dalbake, when he leaves the army, he settles in Richmond in North Yorkshire. Crawford, Tommy Crawford, as they call him, he settled in Darlington, uh, which is maybe half a day's walk. So they're settling close to each other. Um, and military service also gives them an occupation, uh, it, uh, particularly if they're musicians, and a number of them then become civilian musicians. So uh, Peter Simons uh, is, is in London. Levi Baldwin, who's an American, settles in Birmingham. Uh, uh, Edward Francis, a Jamaican who served in the Guards, but also in the 4th Dragoons and the 18th Foot, he settles in London as well. So it gives them something that they can use after service. Uh, and, and we were looking back almost as if we're very cynical about it and seeing this as, as a very negative, horrible time, which, of course, it was in many ways. But, but I think often for these men, they're individual regiments, and, and there's no concept of the army. So today you join the army, but then you wouldn't join the army. You join the 4th Dragoons, and that's your life. Uh, and I think the regimental families must have been really important to them. Um, and that's why so many re-enlist. Uh, yeah. And I think when I did my thesis, which is over 20 years ago, I... I I think it was something like it was three times more likely than a white soldier to re-enlist. Well, why would you do that if you didn't like it? Um, and, and when we look at the backgrounds, and this isn't something that we've covered, we generally, for most of them, we know nothing about them before they join up other than occupation. And mainly that's labourer. But then labour is, labor is kind of the defunct occupation that everybody writes down. What do you do? Oh, a bit of this, a bit of that. Oh, labourer, right? A, a, a fair few are hairdressers as well. Um, but those that we do know something of, um, uh, we, we actually, they're free. So they're free, like George Wise, his parents were escaped slaves. He was free. Uh, George Rose is a reference to slavery, but I mean, his his father, I think, was um, was from Inverness, and and he's a white man. Uh, Loveless Overton, who served in the Second Dragoon Guards, he's a free black man. Um, uh, and some of them are Masons, and Masons, I don't think you could be a, a former slave or a slave and be a Mason. So there must have been a check on, on whether they were born free or enslaved. Um, uh, th those born in, in Britain and Ireland would have been free. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, just, it's just, I think it's fascinating. I, I mean, mm. ma mainly for me, it challenges my own assumptions about the past. So you've already mentioned uh, a couple of characters who became band sergeants and so on. Are there any other examples of black soldiers uh, who did become NCOs and senior NCOs and so forth? Uh, there, there are several of them, but, but in context out of 500 men, there, there's, there's about a dozen of them. Um, but to understand the opportunities for promotion uh, in the band or the drums, there is only one band sergeant. There's only one drum major sergeant. There's only one trumpet major. And you might have 10 to 20 men, band drums, going for those. And, and even white soldiers had to if they were bandsmen or musicians, had to transfer it in, into the rifle companies to actually get promoted. So the black soldiers can't do that, but some of them do get promoted. Um, and invariably, it's musical roles. So uh, Samuel Allen, who was in the Somerset militia, he's an American, 
he's a sergeant, but he's served 20 years before he's promoted. George Toombs from St. Domingo served in the Caribbean and in the Peninsular War. He becomes trumpet major. He's trumpet major in the 20th Light Dragoons and in the 2nd Dragoon Guards. And it's interesting because the 2nd Dragoon Guards is the regiment that Thomas Hardy, when he writes trumpet major, bases his character of trumpet major on. So you're looking at a, a level of exclusion here. Uh, George Rose is promoted sergeant. The 4th Dragoons has three or four black trumpet majors. But again, these are experienced soldiers and... Um, and, and, and it's only in specific regiments. I just wanted to finish off by asking what, what's next for you and your research? You know, it seems like you've got a lot of amazing stuff here. Are you, are you, are you thinking of writing a book or are you thinking of changing your, your focus of your research? What's next for you? I'm going to continue to publish online or elsewhere, but ideally, yes. Um, uh, I, I think there's, a, there's a, at least a, one book in it. Uh, there are so many men and, and, and I think we have to highlight their presence uh, firstly, be because history is about trying to find as close to the truth as we can get. Secondly, it's to credit them. Uh, thirdly, because although their presence at the time is known uh, and it's quite high profile, uh, I think what's happened afterwards is they've been marginalised and excluded. Uh, there are very few authors who actually include black figures or references to them in passing. Uh, Alan Malice does. Uh, in his uh, Hervey no novels of the uh, Napoleon it was and afterwards, uh, they don't generally get put on um, documentaries or, or, or on any kind of t TV series or films. Uh, the Battle of Waterloo, I think from, was it 1970, the film? Uh, there are any, uh, that we know now that there were at least nine and, and that's based just on pension returns. Um, so I, I think it's important that people know about them. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's probably going to be a book uh, if I've got time. So I think that will be a really interesting and important book if John finds the time to write it. Anyway, guys, that's enough for this month. Next month, I have a mini episode for you. My old friend Marcus Cribb has recorded a short monologue on Wellington's way of war, which is great. And also, if I can get my act together, I'm hoping to release a second episode next month, a solo one, all about the staggering Allied victory at Vittoria in 1813, an incredibly decisive battle that essentially broke the French in Spain. That will either be out in November or possibly December, depending on how, on how the workload in my day job stacks up. Anyway, guys, until then, keep your powder dry and your bayonet sharp. The French aren't beaten just yet.